Rick D'Amico. Yes. Arizona broadcasting icon. <laughs> no. Yes, and I can't believe you're retiring. Yeah, it's probably about time. You know, I've been here 30 years, been in broadcasting 50 years, uh, paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, my 72nd birthday was last April, so I think it's time to uh, do something else. It, Retire and take it easy. You had you were here for a while before, I, you know, I got here 22 years ago, and you'd been here for, how long have you been at Fox 10? Uh, it will be almost 30 years. Th it would be 30 years February 2nd. So that's a good run. Yeah. I think so. Didn't originally come to do the morning show. Right. As you probably know, I came as a weather caster in the noon and six o'clock weather. And when I got here, you were anchoring, I think the 430 or the six, or what were you anchoring? You're a newscast. I think when you came here, I was anchoring the five and perhaps doing a business report on the right. six and nine. So I was you know, kind of busy. So weather, you've anchored news. And then um, tell me about why did you decide to take the morning show? Well, uh, I've always been a fan of uh, a lot of the morning shows across the country and going on vacation in Southern California and watching the way they, you know, did their show. And uh, one day Doug came to me and invited me to breakfast, our, our, our boss, director, yeah. our news director, and told me about this uh, idea he had for a morning show and kind of laid it out to me. And I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to, uh, to uh, you know, do a show that would be relevant to people's lives and still have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said yes. And Turned out to be a great career move, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, it's the best thing I've ever done. As a matter of fact, people ask me, now that I'm retiring, is there anything in your career that you've always wanted to do? And I say, no, th this is what I've always wanted to do mm -hmm. this morning show. It's all I've ever wanted to do, and I'm so happy I got a chance to do it. You work with a great group of people. Tell me about Andrea. Andrea's awesome. She's a very organized person. She's always in the studio on time. She takes a break every morning at 8 o'clock, comes back with her little snacks. Oh. And uh, you'll have to be careful because she keeps a lot of stuff behind the desk that no one sees, yeah, like, like a what? space heater oh. and uh, you know power bars, granola. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to fuel herself up. Yeah. Should I provide some of those things? No, 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 no. You can't okay. provide it. She's on a macronutrient. A diet and she has everything planned down to the very second. Oh, okay. Yeah. Will she look down on me for my diet? She looks down on me for my diet. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't bother you though? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Corey. Corey is like the most amazing person you'd ever want to work with. He's probably one of the most talented guys I've ever worked with in my entire 50 years of broadcasting. Having said that, he's not very organized, so at times he'll, you know, uh, do things that uh, may throw you off a little bit. Yeah, For example, right. uh, sometimes when he leaves the weather machine in a different mode of operation, I don't know if anybody cares about this, but it doesn't work for me. For oh, right. Me. What job. else can I say about Corey that, uh, that people could? Here, here's, uh, one th when I was filling in for you one time, yeah. I'm sitting on the couch, and it was a break, uh, or maybe as I was reading something, and all of a sudden, here comes Corey walking through in a Speedo bathing suit. <laughs> and He's nothing done that else. A number of times. And I turned to Andrea and I said, is he getting ready to do some kind of a bitch? He goes, no, every once in a while he just does that. <laughs> is that true? That's yeah, very true. Corey is very He's much so into, into dress up. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, many of the, the live uh, uh, segments that he does, he dresses for the part. It could be uh, a, a superhero costume or a cowboy or whatever. Or a Speedo. He's, or a Speedo if he's doing like a swimming thing. <laughs> One time uh, he was scheduled to do a headline on the program and he was running behind because he has a little dressing room behind the set. Mm. So he came out with his shirt on and tie, but no pants. <laughs> and he said, I don't think I'm gonna make it. <laughs> that may, on and the air? I didn't make that up. Oh. <laughs> That would have been a first. I don't think Doug was <laughs> on that one. But he had boxer shorts on. Oh, okay. You know, it's okay. Oh, that's funny. Uh, Ron. Ron is great. The thing with Ron is Ron knows everything about politics, uh, about presidential history. You can rely on Ron to ad lib about anything. However, the point I have to make about Ron is when you walk into the studio the first thing in the morning, don't look at his ties. Wow. Yeah, because his, his ties are going to... They're going to be what embarrassing. Are you I think he needs new ties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Maybe he's just kind of going for throwback. Or maybe he's going he's for. A, yeah, classic. he's going, yeah. For what? Classic. Oh, that's classic, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ron. Bagging on Ron and his ties. Uh, and uh, who did I miss? Celeste. Celeste Love never Celeste. stops talking. She's very chatty. <laughs> <laughs> but fun to listen to. <laughs> I think, Good. you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever met anyone and worked with anyone that's 
happier than Celeste. She's always up, isn't she? She's always. I have never seen her down. She's always happy. That's huge. She's the happiest person I've known in television and chatty. You think you're probably going to stay in touch, right? Sure, if you could uh, reach me when I'm on my boat <laughs> <laughs> out to sea <laughs> or out to happy hour. <laughs> You brought it's a wealth of other experiences, though, into this. I mean, radio, let's, let's go back. When you very first got into broadcasting, what were you doing? Well, I was in the Air Force. I joined the Air Force uh, to get into Armed Forces Radio, and instead they made me a hospital administrator. So wow. uh, I don't think they thought I was qualified to uh, run a hospital, okay. uh, and so I did that. But there was I was in a little town in Georgia, Albany, Georgia, and they had three or four radio stations, Deep South, early 60s and I walked into a radio station and I said hey I want to want to work here I want to be a disc jockey and said, do you have any experience I said no but I'm you know willing to learn and that's the old story and that was enough, oh, huh? they took me on and they trained me and uh, never paid me but they trained me and that's how I started my broadcasting career then when I got out of the Air Force I was in radio for a good 19 years before uh, being in television full time. How'd you make the move from radio to TV? Well, there's an old uh, story about uh, the last radio station I worked at. I couldn't work there after what they said to me. What was that? You're fired. fired. <laughs> I saw that one coming. <laughs> that will pretty much limit your options at that station. <laughs> station. Right. And uh, it just so happens that I had always had, uh, in radio, I had always believed that the radio stations should, in addition to making a profit, obviously, and serving the public, but they should also spend a lot of time in charitable endeavors. So I always got involved in telethons and raising money for various charities and I had done a number of telethons over the years. So when I lost my job in that radio station, on the very same day I was hired by the NBC affiliate in Lansing, Michigan to be a weathercaster. Oh wow. Yeah. I really didn't know a lot about the weather at the time and uh, after they hired me driving home I stopped by at the library <laughs> and I uh, walked in and the librarian said can I help you? I With said, like books things, right? <laughs> I said I've just catalog. been hired as a weatherman. Sure. You have any books on that? <laughs> and uh, so th but then I was in the original graduating class of the Mississippi State Broadcast Meteorology Program. Oh, wow. So I you know learned a little bit about that. Yeah, now you know what you're talking about. Well a little bit. Yes. Things change a lot though. And so you, how'd you get from weather, so you got hired here for straight weather, correct? Yeah, I you came went to, to Cleveland first, right? No, I, I moved here from Lansing, Michigan. Oh, okay. I, I was doing, I came here to do the weather at noon and 6 p.m. And uh, back in those days, you know, you spent a lot of time preparing the weather and I would get in around 9 o'clock in the morning and go over the weather maps and do my own forecasting. And one morning there was a breaking news event and uh, they needed somebody to sit at the anchor desk and do it. And I thought, well, I could do that. And they asked me and I did it. And little by little, they kind of led me into news anchoring. That's and amazing. then when the legendary Bill Close retired, right. who had been here for a long time, uh, they asked me to um, take his place and anchor the noon and five o'clock news. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. It's weird, isn't it, in this business sometimes how uh, some little twist of fate or somebody just not being here that one day when there was breaking news led to a whole different path for you. That's exactly the way it happened. And uh, as it uh, turns out, back in those days, we were a CBS affiliate, so we were playing programming. They were two, three hours old. CBS had a news update, which would have been three hours old on our station, so we covered it with a news, our own local news, mm -hmm. and I, they asked me to do that, and that was kind of like the beginning, too. Uh, and so how long have you been on the morning show now? Well, I think it's getting close to 19 years, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and and this version of it, yeah. And I would imagine there are some days uh, or stories or people that really stick out in your mind. Can you think of any? Oh, there's just quite a few, yeah. We've uh, been some zany times with um, comedians, uh, some uh, very you know poignant interviews. Uh, I think the closest I ever came to really breaking down in tears was uh, when Pat Tillman's mother came on because mm -hmm. I was just so in awe of Pat Tillman being an excellent athlete and then when he went on and gave up his career to be an Army Ranger and then the morning we found out that he died was heartbreaking for me and for all of us on the staff and then later his mom came on to talk about her book and how how the Army handled it and how they stonewalled it and changed their tune a number of times. I was really heartbroken, uh, kind of broke down a little bit. Uh, I would imagine some big breaking news events. 9-11, uh, I imagine, was pretty heavy for you. Well, I'll never forget that morning. Uh, we were all sitting at the anchor desk, and of course we got this <coughs> uh, a, a news bulletin that said a plane hit the, hit the World Trade Center, and you know, I thought, well, what, some, some guy in a little tiny little airplane 
by mistake, made a wrong turn. And so live, we're watching it happen. The second plane hit the uh, tower, the World Trade Center, and I was just completely blown away. I just couldn't believe it. It, it, it looked like we were watching like a, like a disaster movie. Right. And of course, that day was probably the longest day of our lives, all of us, when we you know, spent the day trying to cope with that and cover that. It's really sad. And that one moment when that second plane hit, when you realized this was not an accident. There's no accident. Here. Right. It's giving me uh, goosebumps talking about yeah. that. It was such a heavy, heavy thing. And our lives really haven't been the same since, have no, they? Not at all. And I remember going home that night after that long day, sitting out on the patio, and it was just totally silent. The sky was totally silent. Now, we live in a big aviation community here, and I'm not that far from Deer Valley Airport and uh, Sky Harbor outbound and inbound. You know, sometimes you see the planes, you hear them. You're always in the background. Right. Totally silent, not a plane in the sky. And we were just shaken to our, our, uh, our souls on that day. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and I think back on that too, about how it was one of the few times that you'd walk outside or maybe a neighbor would come over and just talk to you. I mean, yes. every, everybody, it was, we were one at that point. Right, yeah, we got on a, on a subway and you would think that, you know, the New Yorkers are kind of hardened. They were all talking and actually pointing out places for us to go and visit to do stories mm -hmm. about New York and how it's coping in the aftermath of 9-11. It was a very friendly town at that time. Right. <laughs> What's the first thing you're going to do when you uh, walk off the set here on your on August 1st? Uh, I'm going to go home and take a nap. Uh, the following morning, we're flying out to uh, San Diego. We're going to be on the boat for a while. Haven't been there in some time. You and love your boat. Yeah, I do. I, well, I, you know, it's the boat, but it's the atmosphere and being on the dock and being in near the ocean. Something about the water, right? Yeah, John F. Kennedy said something about uh, we all come from the sea, and that's why we have such a fascination to be near it again. Yeah. Uh, you also did a series of, of kind of crazy promos, right? Log ride, hot air balloon. Did you like the promos? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, the you log the ride. Okay. Well, so it was in February, and uh, it, was, yeah, it was at the Wildlife World Zoo, and it was really chilly. cold. Yeah, it was yeah. chilly. And uh, there were, I think, five of us uh, from the morning show. Me, Ron, Andrea, Kristen Anderson, mm -hmm. Corey. So we wanted to take this log ride over down and splash into the water. So the technician guy that runs the log ride said, you can't put five people on a log. Are you kidding? And we said, why? What will happen? He said, you'll be swamped. <laughs> and so what happened? We were swamped. Oh, you did it anyway. <laughs> Sucking <it> wet. <laughs> and then they said, OK, thanks for coming. We'll see you. They're <laughs> home like a drowned rat. Just shivering. Yeah. <laughs> but the promo was awesome. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, that was a good I bet one. You did. <laughs> the dancing promo was great. I love the I dancing promo. I didn't like promo. that at all. <laughs> oh, really? You look pretty good. Uh, I don't know. For some reason, I have it in the back of my mind that I can't dance. Maybe somebody told me that when I was like in fifth grade. Or, or you something. watched yourself. <laughs> You know what? I love the effort, though. The effort was great. Oh, it was so hard. I just looked so bad. But anyway, I think what really was humiliating was this morning news team in Chicago uh -huh. <laughs> made fun of us, showed at it, was making fun of us. And then, of course, the evening comedians uh, on some of the talk shows always poked fun at us, too. I liked it. You know, I, yeah, you put me down in the, in the like column. So you didn't have to do that. That's why you liked it. I got to watch. <laughs> and that was perfect from a distance. I thought you guys all looked great. Well, good, Rick. Uh, you know what? Uh, it's been an honor for me. I haven't worked with you very closely in the last, what, 15, 19 years. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I watched you early on when I got here, and I tried to emulate some of the things you did. You were oh, an excellent well, news thank anchor. You, yeah, I loved your business reporting when I first got here. And, and, uh, and now, um, I, you know, I will never be able to replace you. Well, it's, it's not going to happen. Like I said, you're an Arizona icon. But I, just, I hope that I can get in and, and at least make you proud going forward that I'll take care of your show. Well, thank you. That, that's an honor for, uh, for you to say that to me. Yeah, I'm yeah. really honored that you would feel that way. I don't think you really have to replace me. I just think you have to be who you are. I, you know, I really love your work. You know, you and I are good friends. We talk to each other a lot. And uh, I admire what you do. I especially admire what I call your swashbuckling reports. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fun. And I think, well, I'd love to do that, but I could never do what he does. Oh, yeah. And uh, I hope you continue that. That's so much fun to watch. Yeah. Any, any advice? Uh, yeah. Uh, show up on time and don't bump into the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two excellent pieces of advice. 
It's bumping into, you bump into furniture a lot? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Well, it's easy to do, you know. We're always walking around the right. whole studio and everything. But you also told me, when we were having a conversation recently, you said, be yourself. Why is that important? <sighs> it's because there's only one you. You know what I mean? And uh, if you feel like you have to be somebody else, it won't be true to you. I was uh, doing the morning show in uh, New York on CBS this morning. And uh, when Ruth and I arrived in New York, the night before we went on, I went on, we ate at Houlihan's restaurant. This is an example of why you should be yourself. So the following morning, I'm sitting in the uh, studio live on network television, coast to coast, with Harry Smith and Paul Zahn and Chris Matthews and uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and we're all sitting around a table. Yeah, and so they, they come out of the commercial break, and Harry Smith says, "Well, I, he says, welcome back to CBS this morning. I'm here with uh, uh, with um, uh, Paul Zahn and Chris Matthews, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and Rick D'Amico's here from our TV station in Phoenix, Arizona." So he looks over to Chris Matthews and he says. Chris, tell, you just got back from Northern Ireland. What's going on over there? So Chris Matthews starts talking about Northern Ireland. And immediately in the back of my head, I was going, beep, 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 beep. Hey, what am I going to say? Wh wh what happens if they <laughs> ask me about this, you know? And so he's talking about the unrest, which I never did understand anyway, but the, you know, the violence. And, and so finally, Chris stops talking. There's a lull in the conversation. Harry Smith looks over to me and says, Rick, have you ever been in Ireland? And I said, no, but last night I ate at Houlihan's. <laughs> but I had the corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> and they all laughed, and Harry Smith looked in the camera and went, we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> look, at the, look at the panic look on his face, you know? But well, you, you can't be Chris Matthews. No, you, but you, you got you. the big laugh, right? <laughs> That's right, he'll never get the No, laugh. he didn't get the laugh, you got the laugh. <laughs> right. important. That's a true story, and I, I think about that, I think, well, you just gotta be who you are. Right, okay. and the viewers will accept you. Yes. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Great, Rick. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so happy for you. Oh, thank you. I, I think it's going to be fun.